Welcome to another ed- edition of The Brand Called You, a video and podcast show that brings you knowledge, experience and wisdom from hundreds of successful individuals around the world. Today it is my privilege to welcome my good friend Fred Mowad from Bangkok. Fred, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Ash. It's a pleasure being on the show. Fred grew up in Geneva, lives in Thailand. He's an MBA from Harvard. He's a member of the HBS Global Advisory Board. He's a graduate gemologist and we're going to speak to him about his gems. He's the founder of Synergia One Group. His family is traditionally been in jewelry and like me he's a very very passionate ypo member so fred tell me a little bit about your early work and some of your learnings my early work well i've had a very entrepreneurial journey mm-hmm. and uh, i'm a very creative person so i remember even back in college i started a travel agency i also got an entertainer a singer from lebanon and had him tour in the summer throughout the US. So I, I started a number of ventures while going to the US. I always wanted to build a company. I don't know why. Mm-hmm. I think it was maybe my blood in my DNA. Mm-hmm. And then um, I studied business at uh, Pepperdine University, then studied gemology. And then I went uh, to the family business, came in with a lot of um, enthusiasm, with a lot of energy, some idealism. And after three years of working in the company, I realized that uh, it was, not, it was not easy in the sense that my father at the time was not necessarily willing to delegate. There was a bit of tension and I felt that I was not able to really grow and, and make a contribution without somehow stepping on other people's feet. So I decided then to go back to school. That's where I decided to go to Harvard. Luckily got accepted and after Harvard decided to build my own ventures. So I got, I started with gemstone trading, opened a coffee chain in Thailand, opened a a number of different businesses, a media company, an internet company. Then I expanded all these businesses. And in 2010, my father called us in August. In fact, August of 2009, he said, I'm thinking of retiring and uh, let's come up with a plan. And that's after 17 years of really running on my own, not being involved in the family business. And a week later, he calls as well, no, it's no longer going to be a two, three year plan, but on the 1st of January, 2010, I'm handing over the company and you will be managing it with your brothers. So we were quite surprised, but in hindsight, it's because he knew he had to undergo second open heart surgery, which he did successfully in February of 2010, but he did hand over after managing the company very tightly for 45 years. He did completely hand over the management and the ownership in 2010. And as such, for the last 10 years with my brothers, I've also been looking after the family business in addition to the portfolio of companies that I had started previously. So let's start with the the first part of your business, which is the family business, Mowat Jewelry. Before I get into more details, why Thailand? Thailand, it's because I started working for the family business in 1990. And at the time, it was the first Gulf War. Saddam Hussein had invaded Kuwait. Our headquarters were in Saudi Arabia. So my father said, well, why don't you go and manage our factory in Bangkok? In 1988, he had opened a factory in Bangkok. I came in 1990. We had no general manager. So I came in as the vice president of the group. I was 21 years old. I was parachuted in Bangkok. And I was told manage 250 people with about 20 expats as a factory. So talk about learning about uh, how to lead at a young age. But I very much enjoyed the experience, spent uh, 12, 14 hour days working uh, full time for the organization. And what I did is I really wanted to learn the entire business. So I made sure to understand every single position in the organization. So instead of coming in, and feeling entitled that I'm the vice president and I'm running this factory, I came in as a learner and I said, well, I really want to understand every single part of this company and I want to start making improvements. I was very passionate about quality management at the time. So I put a system in place and it was a system of 22 quality control checkpoints. And that's still being implemented today. Over 30 years later, it's still being implemented at the factory. So let's let's move to the next part, which is, you know, uh, I was reading about you and you were responsible 
or Muwa Jewelry was responsible for designing the Miss Universe crown. Mm -hmm. Now that's very, very prestigious. Tell me about this experience. So prior to Miss Universe, I want to mention that we had the collaboration with Victoria's Secret mm -hmm. for about 16 years, since 2001, and created 11 um, of their bras, mm -hmm. the fantasy bras, ranging anywhere from $2 million to $11 million. In fact, one of them has a World Guinness record for it. So as we found out that the opportunity with Victoria's Secrets would slow down because they stopped their fashion show, their yearly fashion show, we were looking for the next big opportunity. And uh, interestingly enough, 10 years ago with my brothers, we had talked about a crown and Miss Universe and so forth. And we got in touch with the Miss Universe organization, but at the time we couldn't agree on, on a deal. Mm -hmm. So we, we went back uh, last year uh, made an agreement and so that's how we became sponsors of the crown. The experience has been very positive. We did work with the Miss Universe organization to conceive a theme and so the crown is called the power of unity. I like the design because it has ivy leaves that intertwine and it shows that by working together, by uniting, we are stronger. Together we are stronger. So we want to show that Communities around the world can come together and, and united, uh, we can definitely make the world better. And I also like the center diamond that we have at the top. Mm -hmm. It's a 60 carat shield shape, and it's a diamond we bought in the rough from Botswana, a golden canary color. But I like this shape because it's a shield, and we want to remind people that you want to shield yourself from any bias. You really want to take a look at the world without any tinted lenses. You want to give equal opportunities and rights to people around you. So I very much like the message in addition to the crown itself. And what we would like to do is continue, continue that journey by using the Miss Universe winners to tell the message, work with them on crafting a message that can inspire younger people and hopefully make the world a little bit better. It's amazing. I mean, I had no idea there's such an amazing story behind the crown. I mean, that's incredible. But tell me, does this mean that when the theme of Miss Universe changes, the crown gets redone? So we have, um, we have a three-year agreement. So usually uh, we, we will be keeping the crown as such. We are free to create a new crown and it's something we may consider doing down the road. But uh, for next year, we plan to keep on having that, that crown, the power of unity crown. So Fred, tell me, you know, you have, you said you've got one factory in, in Thailand. Yes. Where else do you have factories? We have one in South Africa where we buy a lot of our rough diamonds and we got into that business in 2012. That was always a passion of mine. In fact, I'm a gemologist, as I mentioned, I went to the GIA yeah. right after studying business, but I also for years traded gemstones. So I bought colored stones, mostly sapphires and rubies from Thailand from Sri Lanka, from Burma, and I used to sell them to wholesalers and jewelers around the world. So I always loved gemstones, and it was always a dream of mine to buy rough. I had bought a parcel of emerald rough, I bought a few sapphires in the rough, but I always wanted to do it in the diamond side. So when my father handed over the organization in 2010, very quickly in 2012, two years later, we decided to get into the rough business and that has paid off. So we have a small factory in South Africa where we cut the diamonds that we buy in South Africa. We also have our factory in Thailand and one in New York through a partnership. That's how we got into the rough business. We got into a partnership with an entity in the US and as a result, we became the beer site holder. So we're also clients of the beers. The beer supplies us rough, but we also buy a lot of rough in the open markets in South Africa and Botswana. Wow. And one quick question on jewelry itself. How does India compare with, you know, I keep reading India is a big supplier. It's the biggest supplier. Um, over 80% of rough diamonds are actually cut in India, in Surat. And Indian site holders or diamond manufacturers are some of the best in the world. They've got the technology, they've got the distribution, they've got the talent, they have a cost advantage, they have subsidies from the government. So I would say India is definitely the strongest country when it comes to diamond manufacturing and trading. This is the world of millennials. 
now millennials and gen z's how are millennials changing the diamond business are they buying as much as their old parents used to I think it's it's changing uh, millennials i believe are looking more for experiences they're looking for accessories at this point in time they may be less interested in in jewelry mm-hmm. so we happen to be in the ultra high end we build masterpieces that are in the millions of dollars really rare gems and of course millennials today except for a few are not necessarily our customers okay. so Uh, but it's it's a concern for the industry you know how can we revive the love and passion for gemstones to a new generation that has different interests and spending their money differently and i think it's a, it's a challenge that the whole industry has but we have to keep on doing it through storytelling uh, millennials expect more transparency and that's where as a company we've been leading we have vertically integrated so when we buy a rough we provide the origin of the rough and we show the whole journey from rough to polish and from polish to jewelry mm-hmm. so more transparency more impact millennials want to understand what the organization is doing to society how are they giving back to society and so it is somehow fundamentally forcing us in a good way to adapt to the market and communicate differently and to connect with our customers differently so let's talk talk about uh, the synergia one group of companies and i'm assuming this is what you set up before you moved into the family business right you know you've done diamonds you techno you spoke of technology you set up a coffee chain business how did you manage such diverse businesses So I am a creative and more importantly I'm a doer. I like action. I don't like just thinking about an idea. I like to realize it. I like starting something up. And so everything I started was based on a journey, on a journey of starting a venture and based on that venture starting another one. As an example, I started with a coffee chain. A coffee chain led me to starting an ice cream chain, then a sandwich. and then because i had a lot of stores i started building a back end unit that actually produced cakes breads beverages to supply my units but very quickly i built it independently and i said well this unit will also serve other customers so now i still have that business i sold the front end i have the back end it's growing with the largest suppliers of frozen cakes in thailand mm-hmm. we uh, provide beverages full solutions so a lot of large international chains use us to do R&D for them and to supply a lot of different products. Um for example, I love technology. Uh, back in the late 90s, I started two dot coms. In fact, both of them did not make it. Talk about entrepreneurship, you know, one of them was in the B2B space in the jewelry industry. And I created a magazine to actually promote to promote that B2B platform. Mm-hmm. And the magazine survived and it became a media company but uh, the dot com did not survive because at the time we couldn't figure a way to monetize it so these are just consequences of my journey discovering opportunities starting new businesses and and growing um, horizontally and sometimes vertically and you must have got a large team of people in different businesses running each of these businesses for you I do I do in fact I don't run any more any of my businesses but every single business that I started I ran and I had a model that was very interesting very similar to my experience in my first job working for the family business where I tried to learn every single role when I start a new company I'm involved in multiple roles and step by step I pull myself up by bringing people in up to the point where I become chairman So I've done that for example with my technology company which I'm very passionate about as you can imagine I've dealt and started so many different businesses I always had the challenge of how do I follow up how do I manage multiple projects at the same time so I created a platform called Passworld mm-hmm. and I launched that in 2012 and uh, up to last year I was the acting CEO a founder acting CEO but initially I was involved in everything every screen I was designing it with the team and I was involved with marketing but as the team started growing I pulled myself to the position of chairman today where I have a full-time CEO in place so I'm 
a bit more removed from operations, but the entire business was built ground up by me being very involved initially. So let's move on. You know, you've done so many startups. You know, lots and lots of startups you've done, and a lot of them have been very successful. My first first question to you is that what is the advantage of going solo versus getting a co-founder? Yeah, it's a nice uh, question, Ash. When you go for a partner if you have the right partner then it becomes synergistic it becomes one plus one is equal to three if the partner is complementary to you in terms of skills and you really work together then you can share the load you can brainstorm you have emotional support to overcome obstacles as you build the business mm -hmm. but the key the key is alignment having a lot of discussions alignment and reducing that tension when you're solo, you may not have anyone to support you and therefore you have a lot more influence over your venture. You can make decisions far more rapidly, but the danger is that if you're not a good listener, you may act too quickly and make some bad moves that can actually cost you a lot, right? So there's no perfect model, but I would say if you're contemplating a partner, make sure that the partner is the right one. Make sure that you've got the right values. Make sure that there's trust. Make sure that you're able to communicate. Make sure you have complementary skills. Because if you don't, then that can actually destroy the venture. The number one reason for why startups don't actually function is because senior leadership does not uh, align. They don't get along. So one more question. I get, you know, I, I get this uh, question on mail from lots of young potential entrepreneurs. So I'm going to ask you this question as well. What are some of the basic mistakes a lot of startup entrepreneurs make? There are multiple mistakes. I think the number one factor you have to take a look at is the business model. You, you have to figure, are you in the right industry? Do you have any competitive advantage? And I think most people underestimate the competitive nature of business. They think they have a good idea, but they underestimate the reaction the competition may have to the product once they launch it. And, and very importantly, the talent. You may have a great idea, but if you're not able to work with other people, energize them, catalyze them, and really build that culture of collaboration, you will not likely succeed. So you've got to be a great leader in order to be able to scale an organization. So you have to be in the right business, but more importantly, assemble the right team and be able to work with that team to get the most out of the entire organization. So Fred, let's move to you know, the second last segment of my program with you, which is let's talk a little bit about YPO. You're both, you're both members of YPO. When did you join YPO? I joined um, about 11 years ago. It was um, beginning 2010. Okay. So I am now in my 27th year as a YPO member. Fantastic. And you know, I've seen you so many times at global conferences and you've held all the leadership positions and we've worked together on, in the two regions and so on. Right. What made you give so much back to the organization? You know, Ash, for me, it's not a question of only giving back. It was a question of engaging with the organization. I care about growth. I care about becoming a better leader. I'm deeply passionate about by, by the vision of YPO. And the more I engaged, the more I got out of it, and the more I was able to contribute. So for me, for me, growing requires that you learn, requires that you engage, and that at the same time, convey or, or help other people grow. And that's really the entire cycle that motivates me, and that's why I'm still involved in YPO. You mentioned earlier, you know, about my love for startups. And uh, that also showed up even in YPO where I started a lot of initiatives. I started two chapters directly. One chapter started another five chapters. I started the, the YPO Stanford program in my eighth year now. I started, uh, co-founded as well, co-founded, co-chaired mm -hmm. the INSEAD family program for YPO members. So I love, I love starting new initiatives. And um, so that behavior or that passion of mine was also um, depicted in, in YPO. Interesting. So now I'm going to move to a few personal questions. My first question is, where, where do you draw your inspiration from? My inspiration from, I like 
uh, reading. I'm curious. I read a lot. I educate myself. Um, two to three weeks a year, I attend executive education at some of the best business schools through YPO. So I'm very fortunate from that perspective. I like to challenge myself. I think I have the need for learning. And as a learner, I'm always trying to start something new, learn new skills, make a contribution. So that's really the key driver for anything that I do. And how do you set your own personal and professional goals? I do a lot of reflection. Mm -hmm. So I have a journal. I write at least once a month. Mm -hmm. And I've been doing this for 20 years. And I do three things. The first is I write what's top of mind. And two, I try to come up with solutions. So once you define the problem and you write about the problem, then it's easier to come up with a solution. And the third, which is unconventional, is I try to predict the future. And what I've learned is that I'm very poor at predicting the future. And therefore, I've learned how to adjust my enthusiasm. Okay. As an example, if you mention something that excites me, I know that in the moment I'm going to be very excited about the idea, but maybe the next morning I'll feel very differently. So now I've learned to contain my excitement, sleep over it to see how I feel in the morning. So you learn about your own behavior. So I think I do a lot of reflection and that's very helpful. I think that one trait is almost identical to me. I, mean, you know, I used to be very impulsive and take a quick decision and then later on regret it. <laughs> So moving on, you know, if you, uh, Fred, were a role model to millions of children who closely followed your life choices, what would be the one thing you would change in yourself? The one thing I would change in myself? I think I would be maybe more compassionate, maybe more, more forgiving, uh, maybe at times be more content. You know, sometimes people that are overly driven are people that are never satisfied, people that are harsh on themselves. They, they always look at achieving more than what they've achieved in the past. And so when I look back, I've made a lot of sacrifices. I'm 51 today, and I'm thinking differently. At 51, I'm thinking differently for the next 10 years. I'm thinking about making more of a social impact. I'm thinking of uh, maybe pursuing more hobbies, and not making necessarily the sacrifices that I made earlier. And therefore my logical next question is, what does success mean to you? Success for me means being satisfied, being, being satisfied, feeling that you've made a positive contribution in life, feeling a sense of fulfillment, a sense of accomplishment, a sense of purpose, so success doesn't necessarily have to be measured by how big of an organization you've built or by how much capital you were able to accumulate over your lifetime. It's a lot about the lives you've touched. Who have you helped become better? Who have you loved? Who loved you? What kind of contribution have you made to other human beings? How do you feel under your skin? And I think it's all about having a sense of purpose and being, being happy. That's the essence of being successful. So my last question to you now is, and this is relating to the pandemic. How are you thinking your own life and your business in the new world order? So I think what we need at this point in time is to learn how to adapt. And in my mind, we have to adapt, but I'm not sure how the world will change in the future. So always keeping an open mind about how to keep on serving our clients. What are the best ways of communicating with them? But what's the best way of continuing to serve them, whether it's jewelry, whether it's through Task World or IT platform, whether it's through our Cakes and Breads factory. So it's really understanding where the market is and how to continue staying customer centric and adapting internally to the external requirements that we're facing today. So for me, for me, it's predominantly adaptation, listening, understanding, and making the changes required to survive and thrive. Fred, thank you very much. It's been such a pleasure speaking to you. I wish 
Moa Jewelry and all your other businesses, lots of success. Thank you very much, Ash. Much appreciated. Enjoy the conversation. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the brand called You Videocast and Podcast, a platform that brings you knowledge, experience, and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Just search for the brand called You.